Hello, and welcome back to the Food for Thought podcast. I'm your host, Erin Hallstrom. We're kicking off our fourth season talking about a topic no person or business can seem to escape. And that topic is inflation. Joining me today is Maria Pierman, CPA at GHJ Advisors. Maria is what you would call a contract CFO. She helps companies that are moving from their startup and emerging phases and gets them over the hurdles so they can reach their more mature stage of growth. How she helps them with these growing pains is something we dive into at the start of the episode. We then spend a lot of time talking about the big issues facing small food companies right now, in particular, how to deal with the squeezed margins and increased costs due to inflation. Maria offers advice on how processors can mitigate some of their losses, especially as it relates to supply chain issues. We cap things off talking about what companies can do to help themselves out financially, with special attention paid to the relationships that can be cultivated or improved upon to help with loans or other financial resources. Enjoy the episode! Maria, welcome to the Food for Thought podcast. Let's get to know a little bit more about you, and I'm sure the audience very interested in as well, about you, your background, and how you fit into the food and beverage space. Sure. I am a CPA, a certified public accountant, and I specialize in food and beverage. I lead the beverage division for my CPA firm, which is uh, called GHJ. We're headquartered in Los Angeles. And um, so as a, as a CPA working with this specialization, I often spend my time serving as a contract CFO for clients. And I work exclusively in food and beverage. That's what I've focused on for 15 years and um, have developed a particular expertise around beverage alcohol, specifically with beer and spirits. But I do have clients in all, all ranges of the food and, and beverage umbrella. Um, so I have, I've worked in tax in, a, you know, the earlier stage of my career, but now I primarily serve as a contract CFO for clients. So you talked about being a contract CFO for clients, which just sounds interesting in and of itself. Um, it seems like you would definitely have a really unique perspective and vantage point on issues affecting a lot of different companies. So I'm curious, what are some of the big issues that you see affecting, dare I say, like I would imagine smaller companies since I would imagine bigger companies would have a CFO, but maybe this is a two-pronged question. What what kind of companies are bringing in, you in to be the, the contract CFO, and then what are some of the issues affecting some of these companies? Yeah, um, so the type of clients who bring me in as a contract CFO can come in different flavors, so to speak, but generally it will be a client who is in a tweener phase, and when I say tweener, I mean someone who is maybe moving from emerging to mature phase of their corporate life cycle, and if you think of the corporate life cycle as startup, emerging, mature, decline, they're sort of in that phase between, uh, you know, really rapid growth and still a very scrappy mentality versus a more mature, established, process-driven organization. And um, that's, that's where a lot of clients have growing pains and they need someone to lead them through and show them how to get from one plateau across the chasm and get to the next stage of their growth. So uh, I'm in a unique position because I've worked with many clients over the years in all sizes, in uh, all geographies within the U.S. and some international too, but primarily U.S. And um, so I, I have a unique vantage point and I can, I can draw on that experience and bring the best practices that I've seen work in multiple clients over the years to bear on this specific situation. 
So um, it usually is a, is a growth phase where they'll bring me in. Other situations where I've been brought in is, you know, if there is some unexpected absence of key personnel within accounting and finance, um, for example, I've stepped in if uh, someone's CFO has unexpectedly passed away. Um, another example might be clients who are going through some sort of merger or acquisition, and that's a, you know just a key phase of their their corporate journey, and they might need a little more uh, guidance or handholding until they kind of get to the other side. Usually, this ends up that I'll help them hire their own whether it be a controller, CFO, whatever skill set they need, I'll help them hire that, but I'm there sort of as the bridge to help them get from one stage to another. So that's um, kind of a sense of, of the different clients that I work with in terms of size and scope. Some of the issues that I see affecting smaller companies, you know, surviving through that startup to breakthrough has always been difficult. That's nothing new, but it's particularly challenging right now. Um, the world just changes so fast. So keeping up with market trends and staying relevant is, uh, is more critical than ever because um, we have consumer preferences that are changing fast, go-to-market strategies that are changing fast, and I guess above all, it's about crafting and keeping product differentiation because uh, once you think you have something special in the market, then you have to constantly be watching your back for who is going to either be a copycat or come to market with a similar product and take away that edge that differentiates your product. So that is a, that is a constant struggle, just staying on the knife's edge of sharp. Um, then there are some more structural issues that particularly where we are today with squeezed margins due to inflation. So we're in this phase where the cost of your inputs is rising faster than companies can raise prices on the shelf. And depending on what your product is, there are different tolerances or price elasticity. In other words, how much is your consumer going to react in terms of the quantity they purchase based off of how your price on the shelf moves? So, you know, this isn't as much an issue for goods that are price inelastic. And, you know, an example like that might be milk and bread, staples. Those are things that people are going to buy. But if it is more of um, a product where there are certain alternatives or it's not a necessity, those are much more elastic. So this inflation piece really can, can squeeze margins. So that's, that's a really big issue that um, the clients are dealing with right now. And then... You know, it's not just the, the product margin that's being squeezed because all the other overhead expenses that are below the line, those are getting squeezed too because we all know that cost of labor is increasing and, and uh, goods across the board. So even if you're buying copy paper, that is increasing too. So it's just a, it's a very tough time to try to win. Um, and then I guess the final thing that I see frequently is challenges in finding reliable co-packers. And not only reliable, but uh, specifically around co-packers that you can rely on who can accommodate smaller runs, which is, um, you know, affects small businesses. So that, that's, uh, that's kind of the nutshell. It mostly, most of the challenges uh, relate to structural pricing and logistics. There's so much there. It seems like we can't catch a break. I mean, I'm sure everyone feels that or has been feeling that for quite some time now, but just everything you're saying about all these issues like inflation, supply chain, staying relevant, it didn't feel like it felt a little rough earlier pre-COVID. It definitely has now. One of the things that definitely seems like it has like hit everyone hard is supply chain. There seemed like there was a time where you couldn't go two hours without supply chain entering the conversation um, in the last year. So we're going to keep talking about it. Um, I'm, I'm curious, what are some of the ways, let's focus on smaller companies. What are some of the ways smaller companies can mitigate some of their losses, especially when it comes to these supply chain issues? 
Well, there's good news and bad news. I guess bad news is that there's not a silver bullet and there's not like a single thing that you can do that's really going to you know, get you on the right path and ensure success. The, the truth is that it's just a collection of small movements and small behavioral changes within a company that can put you in a better position, but there's nothing that can really ensure stability in this area. So the, the, the good news is that there are many movements you can make that are small in nature that in aggregate will protect you a bit. So um, some of those small ways are uh, identifying alternative vendors for your key suppliers. So, you know, anything that you need, whether it's cardboard trays or other direct inputs, uh, raw materials, identifying those vendors who could be an alternative source for you. And it sounds so simple, and it is simple, but the reality is that vendor management is, I'd say, over 90% of the time, an area of the company's um, process that is ignored or becomes an afterthought because we just get in a pattern. We've got our vendors, we've got our terms, you know, we don't like everything's rolling along smoothly. We don't really ask a lot of questions because who has time to go through all the contracts and manage the vendors? So a lot of times there's low hanging fruit in either the terms of the vendor contract or taking some time to research and find alternative vendors that doesn't get taken advantage of because life is so busy. I totally get it, but it, it is a simple and effective way that you can start to combat supply chain issues. Um, now, the, the downside of this, of course, is that might mean that you need to hire for this, like you might need a full-time hire for logistics and procurement. Uh, so I, I don't want to advocate for creating more fixed overhead costs that you have to build into your company, but you know you do need somebody who has the time and attention to give to this matter. So it's a, it's a balancing act. Um, inventory management has become more important than ever. Uh, one of the biggest things you can do to improve inventory management is to have a solid software that helps you keep track on a SKU level basis of all of your warehouses, what do you have on hand, so that you can be crystal clear on what you've got available, what's available to sell, when do you need to start ordering your materials. And those, those uh, details in the past two years have become so important, more, much more important than they have been in recent memory. So solid inventory management solution. Um, I would also say, you know, prioritizing retailers so that key business partners are protected from out of stocks. And if you've got, I'm making up numbers, let's say you've got 10 retailers, you really do need to go through and vet them and grade them in terms of, you know, who's, who's an A business partner, who's a B business partner, C business partner, et cetera, and have the discipline to protect the orders from your key business partners because the last thing that you want to do is be in a position where one of those key business partners has an out of stock. And I think we all understand that once your product goes out of stock, you're at risk of getting that placement cut. So that's, that's really important. Also along the lines with those business partners, if you have the luxury of requesting longer lead times for orders, do that. I mean, the, the worst that these business partners can say is no. And again, this comes back to you have to have the manpower on your side to have good retailer management, distribution management, and make sure that you're conveying these expectations correctly. Um, paring down your SKUs so that you can simplify inventory management. One of the things that I see companies go sideways with, especially in food and beverage, is just a proliferation of different different SKUs. Maybe it's different you know, flavors or uh, pack types. But, I, and I get it, I get why companies are drawn to do this, but you do need to temper that with some discipline, especially in an environment like today where if you've got you know, five flavor ways that you want to make sure are constantly available for incoming orders, that makes it so much difficult to manage the logistics of getting the supply chain in order for all of the different ingredients. If you can 
discipline and maybe bring that down to three flavors, then it becomes a bit more manageable. Um, you, you know, also have more buying power with a particular vendor because, you know, we assume that you would be buying more of a few ingredients instead of fewer of more ingredients. So discipline around simplifying the SKUs that you have on offer. And um, along the lines of, of, you know, identifying alternative vendors for supplies, also look at alternative methods of shipping. Um, most of us are using LTL, but there are other options. You can look at freight. And uh, this has been a real minefield lately because both of those options, you know, one seems to be better than the other and then wait a couple months and then it'll flip. The other is, is better than, you know, then LTL might be better than freight. But you just need to be aware of what your options are and able to pivot quickly. So, um, you know, none of the stuff that I've been talking about is rocket science. It really is simple, practical things. But if you add them all up, hopefully you can make a dent in managing the supply chain issues. Sounds like being agile is probably the best thing you can do if you are going to be a small to medium-sized business anymore. I would imagine, or it seems like larger businesses, it's like riding the Titanic or writing, <laughs> writing a, a, a large ship <laughs> trying to fix. But if you're a smaller company, being able to pivot a, a little more quickly is to your advantage. Yeah, you know, uh, it, it totally is. It totally is to your advantage. And the challenging thing is that to be agile, that means you've got to have an eye on the horizon all the time. And that means you have to have a person <laughs> who can have their eye on the horizon. And you know, most companies are trying to do the best they can with few bodies. You know, very, most companies are hesitant to hire because that's just more overhead. And it's, I mean, you're, you're between a rock and a hard place, but if you can, you know, find that balance, I, I think having the, the ability to be agile is, is worth that extra expense. Speaking of pivoting, um, let's pivot for a second uh, with a question about, some industry regulations and revenue streams. So can you talk more about some of the industry regulations that were introduced during uh, the pandemic that might benefit companies and particularly as they relate to additional revenue streams? Yeah, it actually um, was a relaxation of regulations and, and pertains primarily to beverage alcohol. So alcohol is a regulated substance, and it operates within a three-tier system. The three-tier system means that you can be a producer, a distributor, or a retailer, but you can't be more than one of the three. And so as if, if I'm somebody who makes beer, I have to sell my product to a distributor. The distributor then sells it to the retailer, and you know, so on. So um, it's it's archaic. It goes back to days of prohibition. I mean, so we're talking about laws that are almost 100 years old and really haven't been updated, but, you know, that's the situation we're in. So, um, and also, I'll add that every state's regulations are different. So, you know, some states are more restrictive than others. Now, what happened uh, during the pandemic is that a lot of states allowed relaxations for more mobility for producers to sell direct to consumer or to sell alcohol or, or cocktails to go. And, um, and, and this was done because government wanted to ease companies' access to revenue in such a restrictive environment, you know, that resulted from COVID. So we want to take away the barrier so that businesses can stay in business and, and, and not fail. So that, that was the genesis of this. Um, but what we've seen is that many, many of those states have made these COVID relaxations permanent. And what's exciting about this is that I believe this nudges the door open for more flexibility of getting product into the hands of consumers on a permanent basis. Now, it's an it's a issue that is uh, complex and, and, you know, there's a lot of money at play. There are distributor lobbying groups. There are alcohol producer interest groups. And they're all, you know, have different interests at play with lawmakers. 
But I think that this is really interesting and it kicks the door open for us to update regulations that are so antiquated. So um, one, one example of this is like direct-to-consumer shipping and you were asking how, how businesses need to be prepared for different revenue streams. Well, the behavior of getting something shipped to your doorstep during COVID, you know, it was, it was already a thing, but even more so. So um, as companies are prepared to get their direct-to-consumer channels in line and uh, make sure that they have a way to get their product in the hands of a consumer in some sort of mail order fashion, that's going to be important. And I think it will soon affect beverage alcohol companies just as much as it has any, any food or non-alcoholic beverage company too. We're going to do a soft pivot again because that's just not the theme of the second half of this episode. Um, let's, let's talk finances. What are some of the things companies can do to help themselves financially? Are there certain relationships that can be cultivated, improved upon, help with loans, other financial resources? What are things people can do to kind of help them help themselves? Yeah, the number one thing to do is have a clear picture of the cost of every product sold. Know exactly what your margin is on every product. And to achieve that, again, sounds simple, but what it means is that you, you need to have a good chart of accounts that serves the purpose of your company, a good reporting structure, and a solid inventory management system. So a lot of this is around structure and systems to make sure that you understand the profitability of what you're selling. Um, I see you asked about relationships and what can be cultivated there to have a, a stronger financial presence. The relationship with your lender is of utmost importance. I see companies get in trouble with their bank covenants. So, um, you know, just to, to back up and talk about bank covenants, if, if you have a loan with a bank, often there are covenants that you have to keep, and that means that you'll have a certain measure of profitability or liquidity, and you have to report on that on a quarterly basis usually. So um, one thing that I frequently see is that companies will get out of compliance, and they won't realize that until they have to report to the bank, and then it's, you know, it's, an, it's an oh crap moment. So um, just keeping on top of what the covenants are and measuring those monthly to make sure you're continuously in compliance, that means that you have to watch the balance sheet as diligently as you watch the P&L. And um, a lot of business owners will focus on the P&L because it shows profitability, which is you know, incredibly important. But the truth is that the balance sheet shows you the health of the company. I always say that a balance sheet is like sticking a thermometer in the company and taking its health. Because you can see how leveraged you are, you can see information about liquidity, and you can see the historic profitability of the company which is shown to you in retained earnings. So really the balance sheet is going to give you a sense of, is this company healthy, am I on track? So don't ignore that. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, primary primary point, though, is make sure that you understand the profitability of every product and moving quickly when you see that a product is not meeting the bar in terms of what your required profitability is. And I see a lot of companies that wait too long to make changes, whether that's cutting employees or raising prices. Um, there's a lot of emotion around cutting employees, and rightfully so, but it is something that, you know, you need to do quickly and swiftly when there's a downward trend. If you see that a ratio or a KPI is off for three months in a row, you must make changes. And same with raising prices. There's a lot of hesitance around, uh, around raising prices because you're afraid of how the customer will react, and rightly so but you also cannot put yourself in a position where you're perpetuating a lost product. So making those changes swiftly. And then um, one other big piece is working against a budget and get your leadership involved in writing your budget. A budget is a wonderful management tool that you can use through the year. It's not just something that you write in December and put in a drawer for the rest of the year. If you can actively manage your actual results against your budget and every month go through, look at why there's a difference between 
what you expected and what you actually did, asking why, and then taking action on the things that you identify need to be changed is a huge uh, lever to improve your financial health. I would have to agree with what you're talking about, like with the budget, and yeah, it shouldn't be something that you just, hey, yeah, let's do this at you know the end of Q4 and stick it in a drawer, not to look at it again until December of the following year. It's such an important thing to like use it consistently and use it to compare how you're doing. I want to talk about investment alcohol. And I, I'm, I'm thinking about in the context of maybe I just watched too much Bravo or TikTok <laughs> or, or what have you, and I see every, you know, Lisa, Erica, and I can't think of anybody else's name, but um, and 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 oh, why am I blinking on the guy's name, the actor's name? But <laughs> every Tom Dick and Harry <laughs> seems to have like, oh yes, uh, I'm lending my celebrity name to alcohol. Um, so I'm curious, what are your thoughts on that? I know my personal thoughts, but that's neither here nor there. What are your <laughs> thoughts from a professional standpoint on that sort of thing? Yeah, it's an intriguing uh, opportunity, and um, it, you know, it's an idea that has legs. So most celebrities or influencers are paid to do this, or they're trading their marketing effort for equity. So you know, it's possible that you'll get money from celebrities as investors, but more often than not, you're either paying them or you're giving part of your company to them in order for the use of their voice. Um, it can be really effective, but it must be done strategically. There needs to be a certainty that the individual is a solid match to your core consumer. And what also happens if there's a scandal involving that celebrity down the road? You know, you need to think through all these long-term uh, long-term, you know, possibilities because once you've tied a brand to an individual, if that individual does something unsavory, then so has your brand. So, you know, you just need to uh, think through those things and also make sure that there is some sort of legal protection if something were to go awry in their life that might affect your commercial viability. Um, I think that employing a celebrity or an influencer is, is a fantastic way to, way to raise awareness with your target audience. And it also can be used to attract other investors. It raises the profile of the company. So if you get you know, a celebrity endorser and you're able to put that in your pitch deck the next time you're raising money, it, you know, it's noticeable. It, it, it draws attention and it lends credibility. So it can be very effective. Um, the other thing that, that is uh, a word of caution here is that be sure you can fulfill the orders if influencer's influence takes off. So, you know, if you're a small company and you somehow stumble into a major influencer, are you going to be able to turn on that order fulfillment when the demand spikes? Um, so, you know, just some things to think about. I, I, think, it's, I think it is a good idea and effective you just need to go into it eyes wide open and make sure that there is a strong strategic why behind the choice of who you're going to partner with. Not me sitting here thinking what gen company wants to partner with me, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> um, Aaron, Aaron, uh, Aaron Martini is coming to you live in the next year. No. Um, <laughs> well, Maria, you, um, you gave so much gave us so much to think about and so much great information. I want to thank you for being on this episode of the Food for Thought podcast. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. It's one of my favorite subjects, so I could talk at length. Thank you. everyone listening to the Food for Thought podcast today, thank you for tuning in.
You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and just about everywhere you can listen to a podcast. Be sure to tune in next time as we talk more about the stories behind the headlines of the food and beverage industry. Take care. Have a great day.